Thank you so much for joining us, Chris. Truly a pleasure having you on Brand Equity. It's really great to be here. So first things first, you know, as your theme in GAN suggests, it says power of now. Yes. If you could explain to me what power of, or, or what power of now is and B, uh, are marketers understanding the power of now and are they able to really plug into now? So on Twitter, we have these everyday moments that are happening um, across an endless array of topics around the world. And the mm -hmm. power of now is really about how do you harness the energy of all of those moments at any particular moment. Sure. Um, and I think marketers certainly understand the concept. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's just a natural gravity towards these cultural events and cultural moments. Mm -hmm. The things like the Oscars or the Super Bowl or yeah. the World Cup that they naturally gravitate to in terms of uh, audience and mm -hmm. so forth. And part of what you know we think is interesting when we're talking about at Cannes is how do you go beyond that and get into the the things that are happening right now, because right now there are an endless number of ways to engage. Sure. Um, but having said that, I mean, I understand what you mean in terms of movements, right? Yeah. But do you think marketers today are thinking like that? Are they opportunistic in, and, and agile in their movements to, you know, plug in? Because marketers typically are so... Uh, you know, uh, there's so much hierarchy, right? A, they, a, they don't get it because uh, average chief marketing officer's age is not uh, the internet era, right? And Twitter and all the others that are sprouting up. It's a bit tough to plug into technology. Uh, B, the, the, the slightly young generation that is possibly handling this won't have the kind of green signals to go ahead to, you know, use uh, the opportunity that is emerging uh, in terms of a moment on Twitter. So do you see that with, with the marketers you're dealing with or, you know? Yeah, look, there's no question that mm -hmm. there's still a gap. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and marketers are really vested in learning mm -hmm. the new way. I think they need to learn the new way. I think one of the interesting trends that we're going to continue to see emerge is less of the top-down view of marketing, which is we have these beliefs and let's go take these beliefs and market them to the world and more of what Twitter is bringing which is a bottoms up of you which is let's understand what people care about and then figure out our messaging and then figure out from those insights how we can build a better product mm -hmm. or deliver a more effective message mm -hmm. so you know traditionally the world has worked with there is a hypothesis mm -hmm. and you know basically marketers are looking for people to disprove that hypothesis right so let's come to uh, you know how you should leverage now you know, and, uh, and how apart from cultural moments, mm -hmm. which one can plan because yes. you know that they will peak, yeah. right? Uh, how do you ensure that you plug in uh, day in and day out and make the use, uh, make, make the most of, 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 you know, the fire hose as you call it, right? Uh, yes, that's right. So it, it does start with data and starting to understand if you're wanting to engage on an everyday moment, say something around coffee, understanding how those conversations are evolving right now. Um, how are people talking about coffee? And then how can you engage that message when they're talking about uh, coffee? So one of the examples we're talking about here at CAN is the difference between how people talk about coffee in the U.S. versus how they talk about it in Turkey. Mm -hmm. And so in the U.S., peak coffee conversation happens at 9, 9 a.m. Wow. And in Turkey, it happens at 2 p.m. And so depending on where you're wanting to engage, you would alter not only maybe the, the actual message itself, but also even the timing of the message to kind of maximize mm -hmm. the power of that. Mm -hmm. Wow. So you're saying coffee is something that is a constant conversation on Twitter, yeah. right? And you can also time it to the T. That's right. Right? Um, another thing I believe is fashion. Yes. Right, and you're saying that fashion has over two million tweets a day. That's right. That's pretty interesting. Um, if you could tell me something about fashion and why is it a constant conversation? I think it's just something that there's such a shared interest around the world, and it's not limited to, to a geography. You know, it's it's a global conversation, mm -hmm. and there's just lots of people that are very passionate about it. Um, and it's really interesting to take something like this. Um, everyday conversation, um, this everyday moment like a discussion on fashion, two million tweets a day, and then compare it to these cultural events of, you know, something like the dress, which is also fashion related, but um, when you actually start to look at the data behind it, you realize there's a much larger opportunity in just engaging in the everyday uh, conversation. In the month that the dress happened, the month um, that 30-day period. You're you know, talking about the, the gold and white dress. That's right. Yeah. The gold and white and gold versus blue and black. Mm -hmm. um, you know, hashtag the dress. Yeah. Uh, when you look at the data um, over a 30-day period, you realize that fashion actually got 13 times more 
uh, tweaks than the dress over you know just a 30-day span when it went, of course, uh, very, very viral, very large. Right, right. So essentially what you're saying, uh, Chris, is that marketers need to identify these as talking points and create conversation or content on Twitter and plug into these? Is that what you're saying? Yes. Well, I'll, and I think starting with an open mind of what do people care about? What are they interested in? Even within fashion, you know, what are they talking about? What What is driving them to these conversations? Sure. Versus we have a message, we want to deliver it, here it is, and this is just a new channel to go deliver our message. Sure. I think people have to understand this is an opportunity to change their message, mm -hmm. to improve their message, to have a more targeted message by listening first and then engaging. Right, right. Um, coming to a recent announcement made by Twitter, uh, which is that you will no longer license, uh, you know, the full, your full stream, and you, basically you're getting rid of, your, uh, you know, wholesalers and you're retailing directly to clients, right? Mm -hmm. uh, if I could just understand why you are eliminating the middleman here. What we found is by plugging in directly with people that are consuming da the data, we can build better products for them faster. So it's really about us feeling like we have a direct connection to build better products and get them to market faster by direct working directly with people that are consuming our data. Right, but does it also mean that if you're directly working with clients, right, and you have absolutely no intimacy, uh, that it's also better for your, your, your bottom line? Uh, it, it was not a financial decision to, okay. to drive it. It was really about just building the best products and, and services. Um, so, yeah, not financially motivated at all. Increasingly, this year onwards, the focus will be on expansion and focus on, you know, uh, on, on data, and yes. which is obviously expected to significantly grow in the years to come, am I right? That's right. Right. So you're, if you've expanded your team, you're looking to have international expansion, all of that, right? That's right. And I think you'll increasingly see us take a data-first approach to the market. So, you know, one of the challenges in certain markets is... Um, if, say, you're talking with CMOs, if they're not actual users of the platform, mm. they may have a hard time understanding what the benefits of engaging sure. on the platform yeah. are for their business. But the nice thing about data is it does great storytelling uh, and it's very easy to understand. So we can walk in and say, you know, these are the conversations that can happen that can improve your products, that can improve <laughs> your messaging. And by telling the power of the platform through data versus just simply use it as a consumer and then draw your own conclusions, we actually can show the value much quicker and at a much larger scale. Twitter is essentially a microblogging site, but today, as it evolves, it's also, uh, you know, a data supplier, right? It, it could also become uh, a creative consultant, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Which means uh, you'll have advertising agencies will look at you as a frenemy, mm -hmm. right? Uh, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. So, given that, uh, how what what would you position yourself today as? How what, where are you evolving? Uh, what kind of a company are you evolving into? I think Twitter has always been about innovation mm -hmm. and problem solving, mm -hmm. and I think whether we're bringing data or advertising or brand strategy or research, if we're bringing any of those services to a client, we're just trying to help them solve their problem. Our approach is to listen, ask questions, and then come up with innovative solutions. Mm -hmm. Data just happens to be a really powerful, innovative solution right. that we can right. now bring into the equation. Right. So if I juxtapose, let's say, Twitter versus Facebook versus, you know, uh, uh, Google, mm -hmm. right? Uh, all of these uh, players are also looking at data mining, right? Mm -hmm. So. Uh, how, how would you differentiate the kind of data you have from Twitter uh, you know, versus the other two I just mentioned? The single biggest difference is that our data is public. Mm -hmm. And it's not public because of some you know, nuance of a contract somewhere. Yeah, sure. It's public because the users understand that it's public. People use Twitter because they want to be heard. Right. They're stepping up to the microphone to be heard. Mm -hmm. And because the data is public, we can provide extraordinary levels of detailed data mm -hmm. to marketers mm -hmm. to help them really dig in and understand. Um, if you don't have that dynamic, then what you end up doing is providing aggregated insights. Most aggregated insights end up being useful only for advertising and only for certain use cases, whereas our data can be used to solve all kinds of problems. Right. In your experience, which, I mean, if you could name three marketers who you think are, who are really with it, who really get what you're talking about. Yeah. I would say, well, I would say in a broad category, yeah, not to single yeah. anyone out, yeah. but I think, you know, the consumer, the CPG companies okay. are really, you know, they're on the forefront sure. of 
they were on the forefront of the early days of like let's just listen mm -hmm. and understand what's going on but now we're starting to see it really evolve and the area that I think is really exciting is product development mm -hmm. how do we take this data and not just deliver better messaging mm -hmm. but actually build better product um, it is interesting to see that different geographies have uh, different approaches so I'll give you an yes. example um, so in the US what has you know really prevailed are these product companies that are specializing in social analytics and social uh, social research type tools. Um, and these are things that if I'm a brand and I'm interested in maybe doing something like PR crisis management, I can go out and I can look at three mm. different tools and I can choose the tool that I want. Sure. I compare that to say how the market is developing in Japan, mm. where it's more of a systems integrator type model. So you see a lot more, um, let's take this data and integrate it in to the various analytics and dashboards that we have. Mm. And, and I think it, it's not one's right or wrong, um, but they've just taken different approaches is where they start. I highly suspect, and we're seeing this now, where the specialty product companies are starting to roll up into larger business intelligence tools, so kind of moving the way of the systems integrator market that's happening in Japan, and in Japan we're starting to see some of these new companies crop up that actually do specialty analytics. Sure, sure. Uh, but I was really talking about, you know, clients who would tie up with you mm -hmm. uh, for this, uh, for the specialty, in terms yeah. of, you know, getting you on board for data yes. mining and using yeah. that to make business decisions. Yes. Where, uh, where, where is your focus right now, your thrust, and how do you plan to move to other international markets? Yep, yeah. so, um, so we're, we, again, we're, we're fairly global as it is today, yeah, sure. um, and it does tend to correspond to where we have lots of users. We tend to have lots of uh, data activity. Right. So if you think about um, something like uh, Jakarta, um, you know, it's a very high uh, density of Twitter users, and so we're seeing some really innovative things happening there with data. So, you know, if you were thinking about where is our data strategy being deployed, Jakarta might not be top of mind, but in fact, because there's such a population, the number of use cases kind of increases. And give me a sense of how India is doing, you know, uh, you know, on the world stage for Twitter? Yeah, so, well, first of all, with our, you know, our first interactions with India was really on some of the global consulting firms that were actually looking to do, um, you know, uh, global implementations, and they happen to be working with international companies. Yeah. Um, we're starting to see uh, more adoption. Mm -hmm. uh, I think there's lots of interest. I don't think we've seen as much adoption sure. yet as we have. I think there's a lot of playing around and exploring, but we've certainly also seen some great examples, um, similar to the Jakarta example, um, the Kashmir flooding that happened back in uh, September, Twitter played a key role in actually helping find people that might have been stranded and actually mm -hmm. deploying resources to the areas sure. that needed it most. A lot of uh, the social uh, behemoths, right, are becoming increasingly competitive, for instance, Facebook, right, had, had, um, had brand pages, right? And brands were going crazy about likes, right? And suddenly they decided to change the, uh, the way it works, right? So we have 0% organic reach. So your likes are null and void, right? So it's essentially because, uh, because they, need, they want more engaging content or they want more money, whatever yeah. the case might yeah. be, right? So also when you uh, put up a YouTube link uh, on Facebook, the reach really drops. So, you, you, so they're forcing native uh, video play because that's their thrust. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure how it works on Twitter if I post a YouTube link whether um, you know my reach will go up or down if you could explain to me but you know this competition and competitive landscape will ensure that I am in your platform and I play by your rules and this multi uh, the, the multitasking of platforms is obviously going to shrink within time. What's your sense on that? No, I think I think that's one side of the equation yeah. and for every competitive dynamic where where a platform is saying this is our specialty and we feel like you know a direct relationship matters for every one of those there's another relationship where where there's partnerships and you know the, the a lot of the social platforms have a lot of partnerships i talked about our relationships with tumblr and wordpress and foursquare and increasingly you know we cooperate on some things we draw differentiation and others so i don't think it's a case where we're becoming more and more siloed. I do think it is a case that social platforms are maturing and they're understanding what is their specialties and what are just things that they need to do to operate their business. Mm -hmm. On the data distribution side, what we're seeing from social platforms is 
that is just a necessity. Yeah, but I'm just saying, I mean, do you think it's smart to be, you know, plugging your own own platform? I, mean, I think it's smart for Facebook because, you know, uh, Google, uh, you, YouTube just doesn't get any reach. And so I'm forced to, if I'm a brand, I'm forced to, to you know, plug in uh, Facebook's native video. Yeah. Right. Similarly for Twitter, I think you're, you, you're also getting into video play, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in a big yes. way. So, yeah. so, I mean, going forward, you know, you would obviously encourage uh, native videos, right? Yeah, yeah for sure. Um, and I think we're going to, again, we're going to encourage things that we think deliver the best experience for our user mm -hmm. and are obviously the best for our company. And sometimes that will mean um, we'll do that through partnership and sometimes we'll do that <coughs> through direct relationships. We certainly need to use partners to be successful and IBM's a great example. Mm -hmm. One of the biggest challenges for us is people don't know how to actually work with the data mm -hmm. and you know Twitter compared to IBM's reach is a, a small company on a technical scale and so we actually went through a process we've trained 15,000 IBM global consultants to go out to work with their clients to show them how to utilize the data. Okay, fair enough, fair enough. Um, but how do you make money from your data? Mm -hmm. so, so to be clear, we have a bunch of different uh, capabilities to access mm -hmm. data, and we have almost since the company's beginning. So the most common way that people access our data is through what we call our public APIs. These are yeah. public endpoints that people can plug in and access data, and, um, and those are free. Um, and so the vast majority of people actually plug in and access free data. Mm -hmm. For people that are building mission-critical applications or mission uh, critical business processes yeah. that rely on our data. They typically want to enter, enter into a commercial relationship with them to get the added level of service of making sure they're getting the reliability, the service, a sustainable mm -hmm. solution that's not going to change on them. So it's a way for them to basically set our data as a building block for their solution and they can do that with confidence. Right. I also believe that you can monetize non-logged Twitter users. Is mm -hmm. that actually accurate? Sure. So we've certainly talked about the fact that you know we have this enormous logged out audience, mm -hmm. um, and there is content uh, across. Our content is you know spread across the web, and so you certainly um, can see a path forward mm -hmm. where you know someone that's syndicating content mm -hmm. um, off of Twitter should be able to you know may want to monetize it, and we may want to monetize it. Sure, sure, sure. sure. You know, I just had a demographic question, right? Mm -hmm. If you look at Facebook it's broadly universal, right? Everybody's on it. If you look at, let's say, Instagram, right? Mm -hmm. It's broadly um, under 30 with a few aberrations, right? Mm -hmm. um, if you look at uh, uh, Twitter, the audience is surprisingly very different. So have you figured out uh, what demographic you're serving? You know, marketers are used to working with panels of 30 people or yes. 60 people. When you take Twitter's global audience, you can take, you know, we can get thousands of people in any demographic. And so, you know, there's so much of a, a thought process around, you know, I, hey, can I really use this data for valid research or yeah. problem solving? You have to realize the audience is so large, over 300 million active users, um, that, you know, you can really uh, pull out data on just about any demographic. Sure. The use cases are endless um, and the applications are endless and I think it's in impacting the whole world. Right, but you know, I'm just saying, you know, for instance, right, you have observers, mm -hmm. right, uh, and you have people who are extremely forthright with their opinions, That's right, right? That's right? And you have uh, more uh, observers than uh, active users in terms of people who are actually using it um, like the way it should be. What are you doing to get that, uh, that user base more active, uh, to put out their thoughts, their views, etc.? Well, first of all, I think consuming content on Twitter yeah. is valuable enough. People course, find yeah. tremendous value in just consuming content. So I don't think we actually have to assume that we live in a world where for Twitter to be successful, everyone has to contribute okay. content. Um, you know, consuming content is a very valuable experience. If we can make it easier uh, for people to find the content they want and to consume it, and we've been quite public about our desire to go that way, then as people start to understand the platform more, they can decide whether they just want to use it for consumption or if they want to use it for creation. And 
consumption. But clearly we have to make it easier for people to be able to consume the content they want and we're doing a lot of product work in that area to make that happen. Are you pushing people to contribute more? Is that a focus area at all? I think we're no? overall trying to make the product easier to use and certainly onboarding new users, the easy thing you can do is show them great content right away. Uh -huh. um, because people see, you know, Twitter is everywhere, people watch television and they're seeing, you know, the um, usernames all over the place. You watch the news, all the news acres have sure. their, um, their username on the screen. People are, they see tweets everywhere, um, so they want to get engaged, but of course if they come to the site and they sign up, um, and the, you know they want to get compelling content right away, yeah. and that's an area where there's clearly room for improvement is to have people have great first experiences with the product, so they say, oh, I get it. Now I see why I'm seeing it everywhere. Right, right. If you look, if you do, if you analyze, uh, you know, different geographies, which which uh, countries have taken to Twitter the most well, active users? Yeah, so certainly the U.S. is a uh, very active, Japan is a very active market. I talked about Indonesia, yeah. um, you know, uh, there's a correlation to um, countries where uh, mobile is pervasive because um, yeah. it's a, very much a mobile uh, first mm -hmm. platform. I agree with you, but for, for instance, a case like India, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, we're over a billion people, yes. everybody has a handset, yes. but data is a problem, connectivity right. is a problem. That's right. Uh, and. Uh, I think a leaning towards Twitter as a platform uh, uh, will take some sophistication. Yeah. So you know what I mean? Uh, so For sure. Mm -hmm. but, you know, things that help us are great data connectivity, um, pervasive smartphone um, yeah. usage. Uh, we also have done a lot of work on the product to also make it easier and a better experience when you know, data performance isn't where it needs to be. And that's, sure. that's really helping as well. Uh, if you could just give me a sense of some of the best uh, case studies you know, with, uh, with, with clients that you've seen in terms of usage of Twitter and achieving their business goals with you on board, with your data on board. We're really excited about what's happening in the area of kind of product iteration. Recently, um, GM actually um, talked about a situation where they were producing vehicles um, and they were getting feedback uh, from some of their users that weren't lived in warm places that the steering wheel was too hot. Because, you know, that's something that might have taken potentially years for them to correct, but because they're getting this real-time feedback, they're able to correct it. We've seen you know, restaurant chains change their uh, recipe for french fries well, um, based <laughs> on consumer uh, feedback. feedback, yes. But do you think marketers are doing enough in terms of responding uh, to users on Twitter when you complain. The power of Twitter um, when it comes to customer service is two things. One is com customers are coming to them with more open-mindedness because they're coming in a public dialogue. In the world of Twitter, you often see these dynamics where customers start complaining and at the end, they end up thanking the, yeah. the service agent profusely sure. because they actually are having this public dialogue and everyone can see that the brand is being incredibly yep. responsive and is trying to be mm -hmm. helpful. The second thing is they're realizing that they're engaging one-on-one, -on -one, which is always kind of the marketing dream, but the problem with one-on-one -on -one is it can be very expensive and you don't really yeah. get the payoff. Yeah. But with Twitter, it's one-on-one -on -one with an audience. Uh, tell me, would you recommend to marketers to personify their identities on Twitter, which means that you don't be a staccato brand with staccato responses, mm -hmm. but really are a, a you know a person? Yeah. Uh, do you think you know uh, they should have Twitter personalities? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, because marketers are used to a monologue, which is, mm -hmm. hey, we will just tell you what you should think about our products or services, and in the world of Twitter, it's a dialogue. Um, and the only way you're going to have an effective dialogue is with understanding what your dialogue personality is and by having voices that support, um, understand and support that dialogue. And so it's one of the you know, additional values of doing customer service on Twitter is it lends itself to this dialogue, which is this opportunity to have a much deeper understanding of sure. with your customers about what they care about. On that note, Chris, uh, this was truly insightful. Truly a pleasure meeting you and all the very best going forward. Thank you. It was great meeting you and thanks for having me on the show. Thank you.